I'm Henriette Vance Ball, cardiologist and clinical trialist, and I'm here with Dr. Milton Packer, a principal investigator of the Summit trial. We are here at AHA 2024 to discuss his late breaking results. Welcome, Milton. Oh, Harriet, it is a delight. We uh, always have a wonderful time, and today will not be an exception. Um, I am going to start off by asking you to tell us a little bit about adiposity, obesity, and how they set people up um, as risk factors for heart failure. Give us some background. So this is really interesting. So uh, obesity is officially defined based on body mass index of 30 or greater. But body mass index measures skeletal mu muscle, bone mass. Uh, it doesn't really measure what matters. And what matters, as you just said, is uh, visceral adipose tissue. So I distinguish between obesity and adiposity. Mm -hmm. Adiposity is really defined by visceral, expanded visceral fat, particularly around the heart, the kidneys, other visceral organs. The, probably the best clinical metric is waist circumference or waist to height ratio, mm -hmm. uh, much better than BMI as a, as a metric. And when visceral uh, adipocytes become hypertrophy, they become angry. Mm -hmm. These are angry adipocytes, and they secrete a whole host of uh, molecules that have anti-natriuretic effects and pro-inflammatory effects. Well, if you have anti-natriuretic effects, you get plasma volume expansion. You have pro-inflammatory effects, you get myocardial fibrosis. The left ventricle fills more, but cannot tolerate filling. And that is heavy. Sure. What was your primary hypothesis for this trial? So this was trial uh, is a trial with tercepatide, the GLP-1, GIP receptor agonist. Um, it, we originally designed this as an outcomes trial. And uh, the primary endpoint at the beginning was the to a uh, composite of cardiovascular death worsening heart failure events, and together with functional endpoints in a hierarchical uh, win ratio. Um, the uh, and, uh, whole goal of the trial was to enroll patients who were enriched for the risk of events. Mm -hmm. So we had specific criteria. And as a result of those criteria, the KCC2 scores were so low, EGFR really low, uh, high sensitivity uh, CRP nearly six in these patients. Uh, a six minute walk test, 300 meters, all extraordinarily impaired, but naturally peptides were not elevated because we didn't require them. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't think we, that most people with obesity and heart failure and hep hep who, who were at risk of events would have elevated levels of natriuretic peptides at uh, baseline. We were right. And uh, the, we randomized people to placebo or percepatide long term, uh, target dose 15 uh, milligrams subcutaneously weekly, uh, achieved after about 20 weeks after randomization. Right. And uh, we followed people uh, double blind for uh, a total of 104 weeks, median up to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, in August of 2023, mm -hmm. we heard about the results of the step trial mm -hmm. with semaglutide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the audience at the time, and uh, the step health investigators reported based on 13 events, uh, a hazard ratio for worsening heart failure events of 0.08, 92% reduction mm -hmm. in risk. And I said, that is really so Large. interesting. <laughs> and so what we did was we went back and we cut the estimate in step F in half. Mm -hmm. And we took the composite, which had events 
and functional endpoints, and we split them apart. Mm -hmm. uh, cardiovascular death worsening heart failure events was now a standalone uh, co-primary, mm -hmm. alpha 0.04. KCCQ at 52 weeks, alpha 0.01. All of this was done blindly. All of this was done based on data external to the trial mm -hmm. without even knowing what the event rate was in the trial and with the consultation of FDA. So it right. was really very nice. So it was really interesting because yours might be one of the first trials that are outcomes trials that defined heart failure event as hospitalization for heart failure, IV diuretic use in ambulatory patients with symptoms, and also oral diuretic use that I thought was quite strategic. I want to explore that a little bit further. Sure. Um, because on the one hand, you can capture more events that are clinically relevant. We know that intensification of oral diuretics, particularly loop diuretics, um, are associated with a worsening outcome. So it's clinically relevant. And it tends to be the first way of managing patients with worsening heart failure. On the other hand, if your definition um, is liberal in that you have an array of diuretics potentially included and you don't specify the threshold of increment or the duration of increment, you might add noise. So tell me what your strategy was and how you worked through that problem. We worried about everything you just mentioned. Okay. Every single thing. Uh, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, all we, uh, first of all, a very important, there are two ways of looking at oral diuretic intensification as an event. First is, uh, you can say any oral diuretic intensification counts. Uh, we did not do that. We said you had to have worsening symptoms. You had to have an event, a clinical event, mm -hmm and to which oral diuretics were the treatment strategy mm -hmm. for the event. So we defined the event, that was what uh, drove it. But we, we thought about this a long time just for all the reasons that you mentioned. And we said to ourselves, when the analysis is done, mm -hmm. and this is driven by oral diuretic intensification, the result is probably not going to feel compelling. Mm -hmm. And so it gave us pause. We specified it, uh, we were rigorous about it, uh, but we wanted a compelling result that did not depend on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you defined it as any initiation or up titration of any diuretic? Uh, no, we okay. defined it as a clinical event, worsening symptoms. Right, signs, of course. Okay, to which the physician mm -hmm. said that they responded to the event. The, what was reported was not the diuretic intensification, what was reported was okay. the event. Okay. And they responded to it with oral diuretic intensification. Typically, it was a doubling of the dose of diuretics. Okay. Um, and so you had the change in your primary outcome uh, and analytic plan, as you described, blinded to the um, events that occurred. Yep. Um, and tell us about some of the secondary endpoints that you were interested in. So we had hierarchical uh, secondary endpoints, which included six minute walk, right. uh, change in body weight, and change in high sensitivity CRP. Okay. What was the treatment effect? Okay, so on the primary endpoint, uh, terceptide reduced the risk of cardiovascular death and worsening heart failure events. Mm -hmm. uh, hazard ratio was uh, 0.62 with a p-value of 0.026. Uh, what would, there were very a lot of really interesting things about this primary endpoint. Uh, the, the first is that uh, if you look at the curves, they appear to separate at about 16, 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we thought that was really, really interesting. We can talk about that uh, uh, in more detail. Second is we then reanalyzed the primary endpoint 
taking out all diuretic intensification mm -hmm. for all the reasons that you asked the question. And the hazard ratio was 0.57, mm -hmm. also with a P of 0.03. So mm -hmm. oral diuretic intensification did not contribute at all to the success on the endpoint. The success was entirely driven by about a 50% uh, reduction in the risk of uh, hospitalizations for heart failure or urgent IV therapy for worsening heart failure. Right, right. Um, and then there's the component of cardiovascular death, and you also measured all-cause death. Yes. So tell us about those. So we had expected no effect on cardiovascular right, death and all-cause mortality. No HEF-HEF trial has ever shown an effect on cardiovascular mortality, sure. and we did not see an effect on uh, all-cause or cardiovascular mortality. I will say that at the end, we were missing vital status in four tercepatide patients and 11 placebo patients. And... Uh, How does that happen? Uh, well, it, it, it happens, uh, but, and we tried. I mean, we made a major effort at the end of the trial. And um, the, you know, no matter how you do a sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. on those missing data, tercepatide maintains its effect because most of the missingness is in the placebo group, not in the tercepatide group. So it's really interesting. And yeah. then was there a numeric difference in all-cause mortality? Uh, if I remember uh, correctly, it was 19 versus 13, um, uh, tercepatide versus placebo. Right. And do you think that was a matter of chance or does it yeah, raise numbers, a red flag in any way? No, numbers are small. Remember that we have data with these drugs in right. big trials right. uh, of obesity where there is a benefit on cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. Now, the benefit on cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality, even in the big trials, is not substantial, but it is absolutely there. It's consistent across trials in obesity and diabetes. So, you know, the number of deaths we have is really small. And however, with that in mind, when we did a sensitivity analysis and we substituted all cause mortality into the primary endpoint, it was still statistically significant. Okay, I see. Okay, that's interesting. But then you wouldn't have accounted for the missingness of the vital status in uh, those uh, that, uh, we, 15 we, we, patients. We, we or so. wouldn't have. Uh, but uh, remember, it's 11 missing placebo, four missing tercepatide. So right. if there's missingness, uh, we probably underestimated the treatment effect. Right. Now, your secondary outcomes, including your functional measures, were concordant with a treatment benefit. Absolutely. Tell us about that. A absolutely. First of all, KCCQ was a co-primary. Right, of course. Uh, yes. Difference of 6.9, highly right. statistically significant, big effect, mm -hmm. uh, effect on a uh, six-minute walk, 18.3 mm -hmm. uh, meters, uh, effect on body weight, 11.9%. Uh, effect on high sensitivity CRP uh, at 35.9% difference, mm -hmm. a lowering of uh, a high sensitivity uh, CRP uh, in the tercepatide group. Uh, we also measured a whole host of other really interesting things which are being presented at this meeting uh, by, um, by others uh, we measured effects on kidney function. Mm. We had a cardiac magnetic resonance imaging sub-study. For pericardial fat? For pericardial fat and for Liver? left ventricular mass. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, effects were impressive. Mm -hmm. Effects were really impressive. So there is a consistent benefit Right. Regardless of, and by the way, we also measured other health status indices. Uh, we measured uh, EQ, uh, 5D, 5, uh, 5L, 5L and, uh, which, by the way, almost no heart failure drug benefits. It, it's, a tough, it's a tough index. Uh, we measured New York Heart Class mm -hmm. favorable effect. 
uh, we measured uh, something called the patient global impression of severity mm -hmm. score, uh, highly statistically significant effect. And during the course of the trial, uh, more patients in the tercepatide group decreased background therapy and fewer patients in the tercepatide group increased background therapy for heart failure. Right. So everything went in the same direction. And very, very consistent. We looked at subgroups, all lined up for both co-primary Certainly a class of medications that has transformed the care across disease states. You didn't measure any liver endpoints, did you? We measured no liver endpoints, okay. but we have liver function data, right. which has not yet been analyzed. Right, so you could assess the FIB4 score, we, perhaps. We, we could, and yeah. uh, so, but it would be interesting because liver function in heart failure mm -hmm. is complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it may be liver fat and ketosis, and part of it may be congestion. Right, uh, right. So we look forward to more from you. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? What's uh, next? I, I am, uh, uh, you know, this was, uh, this trial was a wonderful example of how you can take external information mm -hmm. and use it to make an ongoing trial better. And how a steering committee can lead that effort in partnership with the sponsor. Because, uh, you know, we could make a proposal and the sponsor could say, uh, yeah, you know, it's too, you know, it, it's too bold. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, we, we don't want to do that. And that didn't happen here. Right. Uh, so there was a, a complete alignment between our excitement generated from Stephead to make Summit uh, the trial that it is now. Right, and really the first trial um, to test the effect of these drugs on clinical endpoints this is in heart failure with preserved ejection actually fraction. First outcomes trial in heft pet with obesity with any intervention. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and for sharing your tremendous knowledge. Thank with you us. so much, Harry. A delight always.